Hey there, welcome back to Short Takes 331. Today we're going to talk about Toward Quantum Monte Carlo, the Hubbard Sotanovich transformation. And this is the second episode of this series on building towards finite temperature quantum Monte Carlo. And if you recall last time when we talked about the Chandra Suzuki decomposition, I tried to convince you that uh, this is the main object that we're interested in. This is called the Grand Canonical Partition Function and uh, it forms the cornerstone, if you want, of uh, finite temperature equilibrium thermodynamics. And within this object, usually you will find the uh, particle number operator, the Hamiltonian operator, and these two usually will commute. In fact, it, it doesn't make sense to have this extra operator here if it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. And uh, everything that we are interested in is really contained in the Hamiltonian. This uh, object here, the particle number operator, is uh, sort of in there uh, as a way uh, for us to fix particle number through this uh, chemical potential, but the, the main complication is in this object, uh, this e to the minus beta, the Hamiltonian. Uh, the Hamiltonian would be hard enough to deal with by itself, but now we have the added complication that we have the exponential of it. And last time, uh, I tried to convince you then that we could discretize that we could discretize e to the minus beta h by breaking up beta into small steps of size tau with a large integer. Uh, constant here, so so uh, a number of time steps or imaginary time steps is usually called imaginary time. And so if n tau is very large, then tau can be made small to achieve whatever beta you want. And remember, beta is the inverse temperature. And so now we can deal with this object, e to the minus tau h. The n tau power of this gives you e to the minus beta h, and we're back to where we want. But it is at this point that we're able to then break up the Hamiltonian into its kinetic and potential energy parts uh, via the trotter suzuki factorization. And for the purposes of this video, I'm going to consider the simplest trotter suzuki factorization, but whatever I'm going to be doing here today can be done for any of the trotter suzuki factorizations that we discussed last time and others that you will see out there in papers in the literature uh, that people are still exploring today. And so we'll focus on this object. This is in fact the main uh, problem because it contains the interaction. If all we had was just a kinetic energy, then we will have a free non-interacting gas of, uh, of particles, and so that would be very easy to solve. So our focus is on this guy, so e to the minus tau v, and v in the simplest non-trivial case would be a two-body or higher body operator. So the simplest non-trivial would be a two-body operator, but it could have higher body contributions as well if you're interested in dense systems like in nuclear physics or certain liquid helium uh, uh, systems that, that are where, where three-body forces are, are important. So two-body operators, I haven't introduced a second quantization, I haven't talked about one-body and two-body operators in previous videos, so I'll just say now that two-body operators are operators where you grab particles in, in, in pairs, so you grab two pairs, two, two particles at a time, and you, um, you uh, calculate what happens to uh, two particles at a time. So this, this object is sensitive to pairwise type interactions. Whereas the kinetic energy is something that is a sum of what happens to an individual particle one at a time, and so that we say it's a one body operator. So this guy, because it's an interaction, because this V represents an interaction, he cares what happens uh, to two particles at a time. And so for this to be non-zero, you need to have at least two particles in your state, and then two particles come out uh, on the other end. And, uh, and, and so that, that's, that's why this is a two body interaction. If you have a higher body interactions, then, then you will have more than two particles at a time that you have to worry about. And we'll continue talking about one body, two body, and higher body operators in future videos. For now, I'll just stop there, and I'll just say it would all be much easier if both T and V were one body operators. So if all we had was just a kinetic energy and V were, for example, an external potential, which is usually a one body operator, then uh, the Hamiltonian would be just T plus V, as always, and if we could fully calculate it in the single particle basis, suppose we fix a single particle basis, which could be harmonic oscillator waves or partial waves, uh, I mean, or, 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 or uh, spherical waves or whatever it is that um, you want to have here for your single particle basis, plane waves, uh, whatever it is, then you can uh, uh, calculate the, the um, matrix elements of the Hamiltonian, they would look like this, and you have a Hamiltonian matrix that would be a one body representation of your Hamiltonian. Once again, that would just be the representation of your Hamiltonian in your single particle basis. So that would be the basis corresponding to one particle. Now, because uh, in this um, uh, example here, both T and B are one body operators, there's nothing else. There's no other physics that we need to worry about. And it turns out that in that case, if that were true, then the partition function is simply the determinant of one plus e to the beta mu 
this is just a constant, it's the fugacity, e to the beta minus the fugacity, and e to the minus beta h, where h, this h is now the Hamiltonian matrix. So you calculate this exponential of this matrix, and you take this determinant, and that will give you the partition function for the system. Now I'm assuming here, and this is why I wrote one plus this, that these are fermions. If this were bosons, it would be the inverse determinant of one minus e to the beta mu, e to the minus beta h. So that would be a little different. So in this example, I'm assuming that our particles are fermions, but we'll talk more about this in a future video. Now, in a realistic case, this V would not be just a one-body operator, okay? Not only would it just not commute with, with the, uh, with T, with the kinetic energy, that would already be the case if T were just, if V were just an external potential, but now V could be a two-body operator like we discussed up here. If it really represents a true interaction, then it would be a two-body operator. It would definitely not commute with the interaction. And so we really need to come back to the drawing board and see what to do with this messy factor that we have here. Assuming that we already did a trotter suzuki factorization, now we have to deal with this guy, the exponential of a two-body operator or potentially higher. The hubbard sotonovich transformation allows us to deal with that. And the idea is that it is possible to write this exponential of a two-body operator as an integral, complicated integral, that I will describe in just a second, of the exponential of a one-body operator. So we pay a price. So we have a two-body operator, or rather an exponential of a two-body operator, and then we have an integral, a complicated integral of exponentials of a one-body operator. So this part is simple, and this part is not so simple. But at least we get a one-body operator, and the particular form of the one-body operator will depend on V here, will depend on what interaction we're looking at, and will depend on how we choose to do this transformation. There are many ways to do this transformation. Let me say a few, bit, a few uh, things uh, a little bit about this, uh, this integral here. So this is a field integral. So this uh, big D that we put here, D sigma, is actually a product of all points in space of D sigma. So we, um, we have a variable we're integrating over at each point in space. And because we're inserting here e to the minus tau v at every point in imaginary time, then we'll have such an integral at every point in space time. We'll come back to that. Now, there are many ways to implement this transformation, as I was saying. The, that will uh, specify the choice of this uh, one-body operator that will return the two-body operator that you're interested in. But most of the flavors of the hubbard sotonovich transformation uh, involve some kind of Gaussian integration. And this is important. And if you don't know what Gaussian integration is, you may uh, look into my videos. There's a couple of videos on Gaussian integration uh, uh, among some of the linear algebra um, uh, videos. You will find that there. And, and essentially what we, uh, what we can say is that up to an overall constant that I didn't write here, um, the e to the a squared is an integral over dx of e to minus x squared plus 2ax. So the, here a squared plays the role of the interaction and the x plays the role of sigma of the auxiliary field. This, uh, this uh, uh, sigma that we call here is an, what we call an auxiliary field. And, uh, and if you put this e to the a squared on the other side of the equation, you will see that this integral is just a constant that I didn't write here is square root of two pi. And, um, and that uh, is then the basis of the hubbard sotonovich transformation. Once again, remember there's, a, there's an overall constant here that I didn't write just for clarity, but, uh, but this is the basis of, the, uh, of most of the hubbard sotonovich transformations, uh, specifically the ones that, uh, that use continuous fields like this. There are flavors of the hubbard sotonovich transformation where this integration becomes a sum, actually, a very large sum over all points in space. And when we collect all the time slices, it will be all points in space time. And so then you will have a, a very, very large sum that you need to do, which will be done with Monte Carlo methods in the same way that these integrals will be done with Monte Carlo methods. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll come back to that in a future video. For now, then, I want to say that armed with this result, so if we have the partition function written uh, in this form, after having done the trotter suzuki factorization, then for each of these uh, factors here, for each of these uh, um, uh, interaction factors that could be two-body operators or more, yeah. so we have the exponential of a two-body operator at each point in time here, uh, at each slice in time, then for each of those, you insert our transformation. You, you will insert this guy, this object. So imagine you have one of these for each of the tau, each of the minus tau v factors below. So you do that, you insert that, and you pull out then all the integrals and we collect them all here into one big uh, integral over d sigma, over this field. And now at each point we are left with a sigma dependent one body operator. And then once again, sigma dependent one body operator and so on and so forth until you've exhausted all the factors in your Trotter-Suzuki factorization here. 
uh, what we have left here then is a one, the exponential of a one body operator, the exponential of a one body operator, and so on and so forth. So this U here, what I call U uh, hat here, this big operator is actually uh, a um, product of exponentials of one body operators. And it turns out that this trace over all the single particle, uh, or actually all the multi-particle states of the system becomes a determinant of one plus U, where U is a single particle representation of U. And this is what we managed to accomplish with Howard Sotanovich. We turned these complicated uh, exponentials of two-body operators into exponentials of one-body operators, and then we get to do this determinant. But we pay a price. The price that we pay is now we have to do this field integral over uh, all values of this sigma field, uh, which uh, takes on values at each point in space-time. And so uh, uh, we, we get to simplify this complicated trace by this determinant, but now we have to do this integral. Fortunately, there are uh, stochastic or random numbers methods to do these integrals, these types of integrals, which are very high dimensional. And we'll get to that in a future video, probably the next video or the video after that. Uh, and, and similarly, I will tell you more about how we get from this trace of exponentials of one-body operators to this symbol determinant. So what happened here? And by the way, this determinant here assumes not only that we have fermions, but that we have only one type of fermion. So if we have two types, for example, in spin one half systems, we have spin up and spin down, then there will be two determinants, one for spin up and one for spin down. And there are many ways, in fact, to play that game and do that decomposition. A lot of that will be then discussed in future video. For now, I'll stop here. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful and interesting. This is building towards the quantum Monte Carlo simulation of uh, finite temperature system and uh, i will uh, continue this series in, uh, in in the next few days and weeks and uh, so if you find it interesting please uh, like and subscribe and as always if you're looking for a tutor in physics or math in english or in spanish you can contact me at shortex331 at gmail.com or you can leave a comment in the comment section below and i will get back to you and i'll see you next time